You may be seated this morning. I want to thank you for being here. Those of you who are in this house, those of you who are in your house today, thank you for the gift of your time. Hey, a lot of construction going on that you've seen. A coffee shop still functional over here if you want those specialty coffees, but free coffee out in the lobby uh, for the next year as we go through this. Uh, did y'all notice part of the building was gone already? They are already doing work over there. I am excited about the day, uh, just maybe about a year from now, that we can announce the opening of uh, the preschool and uh, new space. Uh, one of our classes last week had 45 kids in it, and uh, I'm so thankful it was a double classroom. And uh, uh, we are making ways to, even this week to get those spread apart. But it just emphasizes the need not only on Sunday that we have, but uh, the need that uh, that we're going to have throughout the week to be able to influence more generation, more families in a generational way. Hey, care groups have started divorce uh, care. I think we've. Brian started last Wednesday night. There is still time to sign up for that over the next couple of weeks if you would like to by going to the connection card. If you've already gone to the connection card, you can go there again, scan it, and it won't make a difference, and you can check one of those boxes. Uh, grief, care, marriage, uh, uh, just uh, strengthening marriages and making marriages stronger, and then uh, a care class on miscarriage starting in the next couple of weeks as well. Uh, and then, again, for all of those on that connection card, if you will check it, uh, there will be someone who will get back in touch with you this week. I want to thank all of you uh, uh, over the last couple of weeks for the cards, the calls, the texts. You made uh, the passing of Dad so much easier and gave a lot of comfort to our family. And I want to thank you. And I'm excited that he gets to uh, uh, hear from heaven now. He has a front row seat every single week. And I'm excited for him and his new body and everything, uh, uh, just what he's experiencing and what he's living out right now. Uh, so for all of that, hey, can you believe we finally made it to the book of Acts? We talked about it last year. We are finally there. And I am excited. You are going to know today. Uh, it is just, it has been fun just reading and studying and looking into the book of Acts. So let me tell you what we're going to, uh, what we're going to do today. We're going to give you an introduction to the book of Acts. I'm going to challenge you to read uh, over the next three weeks, every week to read chapters one and two for the next three weeks uh, uh, at home so that when you get here, the verses that we look at on the screen, you will already be familiar with. We're going to make a few points and then, hey, then we're going to go home, uh, eat whatever you want to eat and then dive back in next week into chapter 1. Well, the writer of the book of Acts is a guy named Luke. Now, you may know Luke because Luke also wrote another book. He wrote the Gospel of Luke. It is like Matthew, Mark, Luke. It's the story of the life of Jesus. And Acts is really a continuation of the book of Luke. What I want to do, look at Acts chapter 1, verses 1 and 2 with me, and we'll take off. In my former book, Theophilus, I wrote about all that Jesus began to do and teach until the day he was taken up into heaven. Right off the bat, we learn a couple of things from that. He starts out by saying, or Luke starts out by saying, in my former book. And when he says that, Luke is referring, the former book is the book of Luke that he is referring to. And he says, in that book, I want you to know something. That book was about Jesus. It was about everything that Jesus began to do. It was about everything that Jesus began to teach. And I talked about Jesus from beginning all the way until the point he was taken up into heaven. So Luke says, what I wrote about was about Jesus. And that's where the gospel of Luke ends. It ends with Jesus being taken up into heaven. In fact, if you were to read Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24 starts with the women coming to the tomb on resurrection morning, and it ends with Jesus ascending up into the heavens by the time you get to the end of that one chapter. It is a passage that we'll be looking at on Easter Sunday. And in fact, let me tell you, there would be no book of Acts were it not for chapter 24 of Luke, were it not for the resurrection of Jesus Christ, Acts would have never happened. In fact, I would go a step further and say that it is probable that without the resurrection of Jesus uh, Christ, there would have been no Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Luke would have not written the gospel of Luke. Neither would he have written the gospel of Acts. Jesus would have been but a footnote in history. Another Jewish rabbi reportedly crucified by Rome, April 3rd, AD 33. Maybe a mention in a paper here or there. 
The Gospel of Luke, as we've seen in uh, this book here, was written to uh, the same guy that the book of Acts was written to, a guy named Theophilus. Luke tells us that he set out to write an orderly account of everything that Jesus did. And because the Gospel of Luke ties so closely in with the book of Acts, I want to go back and look at how the Gospel of Luke started because that's going to play a role into what happens in the book of Acts. So, We've been in Acts chapter 1. Now let's flip back to the gospel that he wrote, that former book that he talked about, and look at how he began the gospel of Luke. He starts this. Many have undertaken, Luke talking again, many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first, get this, were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know this certainty of the things that you have been taught. So what I'm going to do, let's go back to that verse 1 and look at a few of the words. First one I want to give is... Look, First word I want to look at is that word many in there. Uh, and not many. When you think he says many have set out to write an orderly account of what happened. He's not only talking about Matthew who wrote about Jesus and Mark who wrote about Jesus and John who wrote about Jesus. But did you know that there are literally hundreds of pieces of writing that have survived antiquity that mention Jesus? Not to mention the volumes of words by people like Josephus, Suetonius, Tacticus, Pliny, Flavian, hundreds of others. Everybody was writing and talking about Jesus and not because Jesus did miracles. They were writing and talking about Jesus and many people were setting to write an orderly account not because he said be good to each other or had a few pithy statements to make. Not because he was friend or foe to anyone and certainly not because he claimed to be the Messiah. There were people then who claimed to be the Messiah who weren't Jesus and there are people even up to this very day in our world who claim to be the Messiah. But many Many wrote about Jesus because Jesus not only said he would rise from the dead, but he in fact did rise from the dead, which brings us to that second word that Luke uses, eyewitnesses. Luke says, I want you to know, I didn't hear it from Howard who heard it from Wilma, who heard it from her sister Evelyn, who heard it from her son Don. I went to the men and women themselves that walked and talked with Jesus. And Luke says, I not only talked to them, look at what he says, I I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning. I myself, when I first looked, I thought, what is that even like is, is that grammatically correct to say I myself? I thought I needed to call an English person. Well, I Googled it. Well, if you can count on Google, you can do that. You can uh, uh, whatever Google brought up. It's just when you when you put that in a sentence structure like that, that you are doubly emphasizing that what you are saying is a certainty. It wasn't this person did it and that person did it and that person did it. You were looking and you were emphasizing to your reader that it was you. You know it because you firsthand. It is like a double. This is what happened. I myself, he said, I carefully invested investigated everything that was. Going on. And in fact, if you read the gospel of Luke, what you find is exactly what Luke said. When he says, I started at the beginning and I went to the end. That's what happened. The gospel of Luke starts with the birth of Jesus. It is read almost every single year in every single church on December the 25th or the Sunday right around that. And he ends his first book of Luke with the ascension of Jesus into heaven. And then Luke it starts out and he tells why he is writing these books. He says this, so that you may know the certainty. You don't have to guess. You don't have to wonder. You don't have to doubt. You can know for a certainty. And the you there, I think there are two yous. There's an implicit or implied you, and there's an explicit you. The implicit you, I think, is, is us. It's you. It's me. It's all of us because the Holy Spirit chose to preserve this writing of Luke and Acts for us. So I think we can deduct for that that God wanted us to see this. He wanted us to see how this movement got started. And then the explicit person that's there that, that Luke is saying so that you may know the certainty is this guy Theophilus here. This guy Theophilus. And 
I may call him Theo for short in the rest of our time together. We're not sure of the relationship that existed between Luke and Theophilus, but we know this. We know that they were close. Close because Luke not only addresses the gospel of Luke to this guy, he addresses the book of Acts to this guy as well. And he says, Theo, I'm writing this to you because I know you want to believe. He said, and I know that there's some things sometimes that crop up in life that, that, that kind of get you going around the edges and, and kind of pull you away. But I want you to know the certainty of the things that you have been taught. So who is this Theophilus? Well, several theories. No one knows for sure, and I'm not sure whether it's really important. It's more, to me, it's more interesting than important. Because what is important to me is not so much who Luke is writing to, but the who Luke is writing about, because Luke is writing about Jesus. So the top three theories on the, who this Theophilus is. His name, Theophilus, simply means lover of God. A lot of people believe that Theophilus would have had a mom and a dad that had decided from a young age that they wanted him to know about this, uh, the God of the Hebrews, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. So they set out and even named him lover of God. Well, as Jesus comes on the scene and Jesus grows and his ministry uh, begins to grow and he begins to uh, tell people and he begins to not deny that he is the Messiah, the Son of God, one sent from God. Well, a lot of people think that Theophilus began to be intrigued by this Jesus and begin to investigate this Jesus who is claiming to be the Son of the God that he might have been named after by his parents. That is one theory. Second theory that I actually like a, a little bit better uh, uh, is the theory on who Theo is concerned and also where he, uh, I don't think I, I might have heard of that word, but I really didn't know what an ossuary was until I went to Israel with a group from here uh, with Jimmy uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, back in that day and age, uh, a lot of families would not have a, a private tomb for every person in their family. In fact, to have a tomb that you could actually walk in was something that sometimes was reserved for the wealthy or maybe a whole family could go together. And you might be able to get one or two people in a, this hewn out place of rock to bury someone. Well, there would be a box that sat at the end of the tomb. Often it would have inscriptions on it on whose remains were there. And so like if I was the first in my family and I passed away, Way. I might be laid out in the tomb and as my body began to decay and only my bones were left if someone else in my family died and we didn't have a place for them well they would take my body they would take the bones they would crush them up and they would put them in the box and then they you know they might write an inscription on the box who all was in there so over time and you can find ossuaries today there are hundreds people they've been telling me thousands of them in this area that have sometimes a lot of names written on them and they're really like kind of family plots a condo well, when you go, this earthly body, when you, you know, when, when you pass from this earth in, a, in an earthly sense. Well, what I love is that in 1986, just north of the city of Jerusalem, an ossuary was uncovered in a tomb, and it had an inscription on it that reads, Joanna, the daughter of Theophilus, the high priest. Hold that thought. Second thought over here from historians outside of Scripture. Did you know that reigning from uh, the year 37 to 41, that there was a high priest in Jerusalem named the Theophilus? What do you think the odds are that those two are connected? That the same Theophilus that Luke is writing to is the same Theophilus whose bones were probably crushed and in this ossuary at the tomb that they found in 1986. Both considered a high priest. If it is one in the same, that means that four years after the death of Jesus, that one of the high priests at least, when probably think that there were quite a few, but at least one of the high priests had converted from Judaism to Christianity and was this Theophilus guy. Still others say that Theophilus was a, just a prominent citizen who lived in or around Jerusalem and that Luke is his private doctor. Again, who it's written to is interesting, but who Luke is writing about is what's important. Personally, I like option two in there, and I decided to tell you, and the, and the reason I like option two is this, is because I love it when archaeology catches up with the Bible. 
I love it in our day and age when, uh, yeah, when the Bible is proven to be true time after time after time after time. Well, anyway, that's why I like option number two. That's the explicit who Luke is writing to, this guy named Theophilus. The implicit is us because I think God's Spirit preserved this writing for us. So back to Luke. Colossians 4.14 tells us that Luke was a physician. Most scholars believe that Luke even traveled with Paul on some of his missionary journeys. We get this from the book of Acts because in Acts chapters 1 through 15, when Luke is describing what's happening in this movement of the early church, he uses pronouns like them and they. But when you get to Acts chapter 16, for three or four chapters, as Paul begins his missionary journey going to Troas, Paul or uh, Luke changes the pronoun from they to we, and in the sentence structure implies that he was a part of that missionary journey as well. So a lot of people think when you get to Acts chapter 16 that the guy who wrote the Gospel of Luke and the guy who wrote Acts becomes a traveling companion of Paul on at least one of his missionary journeys. All of those things going on. And while Luke's first book, Luke, is about the life and times of Jesus, ending with the ascension of Jesus, Luke's second book, the book of Acts, is about what happened in that early church after Jesus ascended back into heaven. In many ways, Acts is a sequel to the book of Luke. And just because Jesus has gone back into heaven, don't think that we're through hearing from Jesus. In Acts chapter 9, Jesus is going to appear to Paul on the road to Damascus. In Acts chapter 10, Jesus has to come to Peter in a vision to get Peter to do what he's called Peter to do. In uh, Acts chapter 18, Jesus is going to again speak to Paul. In Acts chapter 23, uh, the word says, that Jesus physically appeared to Paul again. And then by the time you get to the book of Revelation, if you look, if, especially if you've got a red letter edition, Jesus' words are all over the book of Revelation. So Acts is not really the end of Jesus. What Acts is, is the end of Jesus' personal earthly ministry. What Jesus came to do and how Luke ends the gospel of Luke, well, that's finished, his earthly ministry. He went to a cross. He died for the sins of the world. He rose again. He appeared to a bunch of people alive after he had been killed. He leaves his people with this mission to take the story of Jesus to the entire world. And then he ascends back into heaven. So Acts is the story of the birth of the church. As that closes the pages of Luke, Acts opens up with that story of the church. Acts is what I call the time in between, in between Jesus ascending into heaven and one day Jesus coming back for us. Because I don't know if you realize this, the gospel or the book of Acts is not complete. The book of Acts is the Christian era. It is the story of the church. And every generation since the end of Acts has written their part of the story of Jesus. And we will write a part in that story as well. We have a part to play in the book of Acts. Um, Acts is the story of those first followers of Jesus who took on the mission, the mission of Jesus, which is our mission today. They are the group of people who took on the mission of making Jesus known in the entire world. And what I hope studying the book of Acts does for us is give us boldness to speak the name of Jesus and make the name of Jesus known in our day and time. If you were here for our study on the church and who the church is, it's going to come into play all throughout the book of Acts. Remember this definition. We, the church, people, we are the called out group of people. We have been empowered by God's Holy Spirit, and that's going to become plainly evident in the book of Acts to continue the work of Jesus on this earth. That's exactly what they were doing. God's church was never meant to be a place that you go one time a week and then you leave and you forget it. God's church was always a movement and it was always a movement outward. It was a movement of people out in the communities in which they were living and out in the world in which they were living who were empowered by God's Holy Spirit because He had sent them. So what I want you to do this week, your, your homework, is to read Acts chapter 1 and Acts chapter 2. What I want to do in the rest of the time that we have together is to kind of summarize Acts chapter 1 and 2 for you. Uh, Jesus goes back into heaven. He's told the apostles, I want you to go to the city. I want you to wait for the coming of the Holy Spirit. In Acts chapter 1, they choose Matthias to replace Judas as one of the apostles. And as Acts chapter 2 opens up, there are these 120 followers who were standing watching Jesus go back into heaven. They have now gone back into the city of Jerusalem and they are doing exactly what Jesus told them to do. They are waiting for 
the coming of the Holy Spirit. Well, the Holy Spirit comes in Acts chapter 2. It comes in an incredible way on them. And all of a sudden, these people who were running at one time, these people who had denied Jesus, these people who were, who, who were terrified because of what had happened, these people now have a boldness that has not been seen. And Peter, last time that Luke writes about Peter, Peter was denying Jesus. And now he's writing about Peter again. And this time he says, Peter stands up in front of the very people who crucified Jesus. And he says, let all the house of Israel be assured of this, that the Jesus you crucified, God has raised him up and named him both Lord and Savior. Well, the people heard it. And because they could not deny it, because there was a tomb over there that was empty, because there was Martha and Wilma and Evelyn and, and every, your, your cousins and 500 people at one time who could say, yes, I saw him alive after he, after he had been killed. Because all of this stuff was right there evidence of They could not deny it. The Jewish leaders didn't like it, but they could not deny it. And all of a sudden, they watch as people by the thousands start turning to Christianity. So much so that by the time you get to Acts chapter 2, look at, look, look at how it's described by Luke. And those who accepted Peter's message, because that's who is speaking, Peter and John on that day, those who accepted his message were baptized and about 3,000 people were added to their number that day, that day. Is that not exciting to you? Is that not like the best start ever? I mean, who here has started a movement and on day one, 3,000 showed up. I mean, like, we're here. And, and I like, you know, I, you know, I, w I was an accounting major in school, so I, I kind of like numbers, so I started looking at the numbers there. Do you know that from that 120 who were in that, uh, in that upper room in Acts chapter 1, by the time that you get to the end of Acts chapter 2, that is 2,500% growth. So you know what I did this week? The nerd in me looked at the number of people who were present here last Sunday. And I multiplied that by 2,500%. So if God would do that again in our church at this day, there would be 41,251 people lined up outside our building. <laughs> and I say that to say that the church has power today. Sometimes we, sometimes we come and we, we kind of treat it and we, and we just go doing about life. But the book of Acts is to say normal doesn't have to be. You can experience extraordinary things. By the end of the first sermon, 3,000 people are there. And what I don't want you to miss is this. This is the church. And from day one, it didn't stop at that. And in fact, conservative estimates say that Christianity grew approximately 40% every Every 10 years for the first 300 years of the church and then between 300 and 350 years after the death of Jesus that it grew almost by half of that again. So much so that the total population of Christians in the Roman Empire had reached 33 million people within three centuries after they killed Jesus. And it started with just that 120 on that day who decided to do what Jesus told them to do. Within three centuries, over half of the Roman Empire were followers of Jesus. And I want you to listen to what one historian writes about Christianity during that time. Why did Christianity become so quickly popular in the Roman Empire? There is really no reason especially at a time when it was illegal to be a Christian. Hundreds of thousands of Christians were tortured and killed by the Roman government, yet more people kept freely choosing to join this new religion. Why did they so easily let go of the polyistic paganism which was typical of the early Romans? By the time Constantine legalized the practice of Christianity in 313, the empire was already heavily Christianized. By the year 300, most people believed over 10% of the people were Christians, and by the middle of that same century, Christians made up the majority of citizens, over 33 million in the Roman Empire. So Constantine did not cause that to happen as much as Constantine acknowledged the success of it. And then he says, and these were not 33 million nominal Christians. In the decade before Constantine's edict, the church had suffered its most ruthless persecution ever under the emperor Diocletian and his successors. The practice of the faith was in many ways and places punishable by torture and death. In many places to live as a Christian meant at the least to accept a social stigma and humiliation. 
To be a Christian was not easy in the year 300. Christians were laying their lives on the line every time they met to discuss the New Testament and this Jesus. But they continued to do it through the course of their lives. Yet the rate of conversion throughout the empire, beginning with the first Christians, long before Constantine was most memorable, remarkable. In the first three centuries of Christianity, there was an astonishing growth rate of 40% per decade. And from that initial 120 we meet in the next chapter 1 to over 33 million people by the year A.D. 350. In the year 260, something else remarkable happens in the ancient world. It's not in scripture, but you can uh, go through history and you can find historians. They believe the population of the world was about 257 million people in the year 260. What happened was an epidemic that swept across the entire Roman world and it killed over 50 million people died. The population of the world fell in the year 260 from 257 million to 206 million within the year that surrounded A.D. 260. I bring that up to read to you what the historian Dionysius of Alexander, Alexandria wrote about the Christians who lived during that epidemic. He writes these words. Most of the Christians in our city showed an unbounded love and loyalty, never thinking of themselves, only thinking of others. Heedless of danger, they took charge of the sick. They attended their needs. They helped and they comforted them and with them departed this life serenely happy for they were infected by the same diseases of those they were treating. With the diseases, they drawn on themselves the sickness of their neighbors, and they cheerfully accepted their pain. Christianity offered cities that were filled with strangers, orphans, widows, the homeless, and the poor, a new family, a new community, and a new way of life that freed them from many of the fears that tortured their pagan natives, neighbors. And in the very city that gave the Jewish people the authority to crucify Jesus, Rome, on February the 27th, 380 A.D., the Roman Emperor Theodius issued a decree that made Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire. In doing so, he ended all Roman tax dollars going to pagan temples. He ended the state support of all pagan priests. And 33 years after the birth of Jesus, when the leaders of Rome and the leaders of the Jewish temple called for the death of Jesus and Rome crucified this Jewish carpenter turned rabbi, with the exception of one of his followers, every one of those people who left their homes and their businesses and their fishermen to follow Jesus were killed by the year A.D. 60. Yet, over the next 250 years, hundreds and thousands of followers of Jesus who were publicly supportive of Jesus were burned alive, cut in half, hung on crosses, fed to wild animals, and put in prison. And yet, 350 years later, although Jesus never stepped a foot inside of Rome, the same disgraced Galilean carpenter Jesus of Nazareth was lifted up and named the official God of the very empire that had ordered his death. And half of the Roman world worshipped him as Lord. And today, in Jerusalem, in the very city where he was killed, people come from all over the world to walk on the streets that he walked on to stand in the river he was baptized in, and to pray in the garden he prayed in. Do not ever believe the lie that the church is powerless to do something. God is never stopped. And I'm going to say what I said at the early service. I'm going to say the, maybe the only political thing I'm going to say in an election year. Do not ever buy into the lie that Christianity is dependent on who runs our country. Amen. Christianity is dependent 
on who runs our homes and our lives. It is the power of the Holy Spirit living within each of us. And I know over the next months, we're going to be tempted to, to throw Jesus up with people who head political parties. I would say to you, be careful. Be very careful about giving the impression to our world that our country state lies on who's in the White House. Our country state lies on who's in our house, on who we claim as Lord of our lives and who we follow. Jesus has never, ever, in the centuries where Christianity was illegal, in the centuries and the cities where Christianity was, where you could not practice it at all, where their leaders, not only the Roman leaders, but the Jewish leaders were against Christ, Christianity grew more than it has ever really grown in any other time. Jesus can do a lot with a persecuted group of people who are willing to do what we just read. And I wonder if God is calling us back to Acts for a reason. If you were to, to go and look at that, I think sometimes it's very easy to look at Peter, James, and John, and, and maybe Mary and some of the women and think, well, those were extraordinary people. I mean, those were people, wow, look at what they did. Did you see what they did? I want to, when we get to Acts chapter 3 and 4 in just a few weeks, one of the things that I love is there's a story there. There's a story about a, uh, Peter and John, they heal a blind man. Well, when they heal a blind man, the people look and they ask, we'll say, well, how did you heal a blind man? Well, Peter and John looked back at the crowd and they said, let me tell you how we healed him. We healed him by the name of Jesus. That's how we healed him by. And, well, the religious leaders, they don't like that because they tried to kill Jesus and then they did kill Jesus. And now Jesus got up from the dead and he's walking around and they don't like people preaching about Jesus anymore. So they look at Peter and John and said, well, we're going to kill you if you keep talking about Jesus. They throw Peter and John in prison. They bring them out the next day and they say, you know, this, this was a warning what happened last night. They ordered them not to teach or preach in the name of Jesus anymore. Well, Peter looks back at them and says, hey, you're just wasting your words. That's Tom's version there. He's like, you are just wasting your words because this is not a matter of who we're not going to speak about. This is a matter of we can't quit talking about Jesus because guess what? As I previously mentioned, you killed him, but God raised him up and we had dinner with him. We talked to him. We walked with him. He was one of us, and we saw him. So you can order us not to talk about Jesus, but it will not do any good to order us to do that. Well, they, they, they look at Peter and John. They decide, we're going to go back in, and we're going to have a meeting. They go back in, and they have a meeting. And you know what they end up saying? Look at Acts chapter 4. Before we get there, when they saw the courage of Peter and John, this is Peter and John who ran just a little bit ago. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, they realized that they were, say this word with me, Unschooled and ordinary men. They were astonished and took note that these men had been with Jesus. You can take the most educated, highly successful people in the world, and I'm going to tell you, the Holy Spirit can do more with an unschooled, ordinary man who has been with Jesus than they could do with anybody in the world, regardless of the degrees and stuff that they have. That gives me hope, because you know what? I am one of those people. I am like... There is me. I read that and I thought, oh my heavens, he's talking to us. That's another way I know. He's talking to us in our day and age. And I think he's saying to us in this, you can do incredible things. You can do incredible things, not because of who you are, but because of who works inside of you. You see, what makes the church work is not so much. And I know God uses the gifts and talents and all that, and I'm not doing away with that. But what makes the church work is not so much those things as it is when the church depends on the Holy Spirit of God to take his message to an entire world. That's where we're going to start next week. That's where we're going to pick up. We're going to pick up in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, where Peter, where uh, 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 Jesus looks to these uh, people and he says, guess what you're going to do? He says, you're going to be my witnesses. And I love how he says it. He says, you're going to be my witnesses in the city where people hate you. And then you're going to be my witnesses in the cities where you hate them. We're going to take everybody and we're going to take this from Jerusalem. We're going to take it into Judea. We're going to go into Samaria. And then you know where we're going to go? We're going to go to the ends of the earth. At their time, you know where the ends of the earth was? The Roman Empire. Did what Jesus predict come true? Oh, it comes true every time. And 350 years from that date, over half of the Roman Empire will be followers of Jesus. And in the very city that killed Jesus, by the very people who killed Jesus, they named him the official religion of the Roman Empire. I believe Luke is here to say, you can do it again. Not by your power, 
but by the power of the one who lives inside of you. And that's where we'll pick up next week in the book of Acts. Y'all have an incredible, incredible week. Father, I thank you. I thank you for these people. I thank you for what you're going to do in us. I thank you, Father, that you have left for us an amazing, amazing message of hope and trust. I pray, Father, that we will live out and that we will be people who trust in you. Thank you for loving us. And all of God's people said, Amen. Amen. I'll see you next week. 